What's going on everyone? Welcome back to Goshen's Games and welcome to a new series on the channel where we read the light novels for Sword Art Online. And while I know that the light novels don't begin with Alicization, we are going to start with Alicization simply because of what's going on in the anime and the return of the Alicization arc with War of the Underworld coming soon to... Uh, to anime. So, with that being said, we are going to read the progressive novels for the Alicization arc. Starting with Alicization beginning. And let's get started, guys. Prologue 1, July 372 HE. Squeeze the ha axe handle, lift it up, swing it down. Such simple actions and yet the tiniest lapse of concentration would cause the axe to miss its mark sending a tremendous jolt through the arms as the blade struck hard bark. Breathing, pulse, speed, shifting of weight, all these factors must be perfectly controlled for the, ac for the heavy axe head to properly unleash its power into the tree and create the sound of its famed bite. But understanding these things did not make them any easier to execute. It would soon be the second summer since Yujio had been given this job, which was bestowed upon him in the spring of his 10th year. At best, even now, he could produce this perfect strike only one time in 10. Old man Garita, who had previously held this position and taught Yujio the ropes, could strike true every single time. Garita never looked tired, no matter how often he swung the heavy axe, but it took Yujio only 50 swings for his hands to go numb, his shoulders to ache, and his arms to stop rising when he commanded them. 43! 44! He tried counting aloud the axe strikes against the tree as a means of encouragement, but sweat blurred his eyes, his palms slipped, and his accuracy fell further. He swung the tree cutter's axe around madly, putting his entire body into the rotation. 49! 50! The last swing was wildly off base, hitting the bark far from the sharp, deep rut in the tree and producing an ugly ringing noise. The vibration nearly caused sparks to shoot from Yujio's eyes. Defeated, he dropped the axe, stumbled a few steps back, and plopped down into the thick moss. He sat there panting until he heard a joking voice off to his right. I counted about three good strikes. Good sounds out of your 50 swings. That makes, what, 41 in total? Looks like the cereal water on, is on you today, Yujio. The voice belonged to another boy about his age, lying down in a short distance away. Yujio felt around for his leather canteen and lifted it to his lips. He gulped down the lukewarm water and tightened the cap again, feeling human at last. Hmm. <laughs> you only got 43 yourself. I'll catch up in no time. Go on, he said. It's your turn, Kirito. Yeah, yeah. Kirito, Yujio's closest, long-time friend and his partner in this gloomy calling since last spring, brushed back his sweaty black bangs, lifted a leg straight up, then hopped to his feet. But rather than pick up the axe, he put his hands to his waist and looked up. Yujio's gaze traveled to the sky with his. The mid-July summer sky was astonishing blue, and in the midst of it, the sun goddess, Solus, unleashed all her light. Yet the tree towering over them spread its branches so thick and wide that nearly none of the light reached Yujio and Kirito on the ground. With every passing moment, the great tree's leaves devoured the blessing of the sun goddess and its roots sucked up the, flav the favor of the earth goddess, Terraria healing the damage that Yujio and Kirito were so painstakingly chopping into. No matter how hard they tried on any given day, by the next morning, the tree had refilled half the damage they'd cut into it. Yujio sighed and returned his gaze to the tree. The tree called by its sacred name of Giga Cider by the villagers was a true monster with a trunk four mels wide and a height of easily more than 70 mels from the ground. Even the bell tower of the tallest church in the village was only a quarter of that height and to Yujio and Kirito who had just grown into a mel and a half this year, the tree might as well be at the titan for which it was named. 
As Yujiro looked at the slice cut into the trunk, he couldn't help but wonder if it was even possible to fell this beast with human strength alone. The wedge was just about a mel deep now, meaning the trunk still had three quarters of its thickness intact. Last spring, Yujiro and Kirito had been summoned to the village elder's home, where they were given the duty of carving the great cedar and told its mind-numbing story. The Giga Cedar had spread its roots throughout the land ages before the village of Rulid was founded. And ever since that founding generation, the villagers had ceaselessly put axe to trunk. Old Man Garita was the sixth generation carver of the tree, which made Yujio and Kirito the seventh. Over 300 years had been spent on the task. 300 years! It was more time than Yujio could fathom. He had only just turned 10. That hadn't changed now that he was 11, of course. All he could possess was that over his, his mother and father's generation, his grandparents' generation, and generations even before that, the carvers had put a countless number of swings into the tree, and all that work had combined to produce this slice he was looking at now. Less than a mel deep. The elder told him in grave tones why it was so important for them to fell the great tree. The Giga Cider Cedar was so large and its vitality so powerful that it was stealing the blessings of the sun and earth gods over a vast region. No seeds could take root in the land over which its towering shadow reached. Rulid was at the very northern end of the Norlagarth Empire and northern of the four empires that ruled over the realm of humanity. In other words, it was literally at the end of the world. Steep mountains surrounded it to the north, east, and west, which meant that the only means to expanding their co to cropland and grazing pastures was cutting down the forest to the south. Unfortunately, the Giga Cedar was located right at the forest entrance, so the village could not grow until it was taken out of the picture. Yet the tree's bark was hard, as hard as iron, no matter, no amount of fire could induce it to smoke, and its roots stretched just as wide and deep as the reach of its branches. So they used the dragonbone axe left behind by the founders, a tool strong enough to cut metal, and the task of carving the tree was passed down through the generations. When the village elder had finished the tale, his voice trembling with the weight and dignity of duty, Yujio had timely asked, if it's so hard, why don't we leave the Giga Cedar and just go around it? The elder sternly informed him that cutting down the tree had been the founder's deepest desire and it was customary for two of every generation to carry on the carver's calling. Next, Kirito had asked why the founders had bothered to start the village here at all. The elder had been momentarily taken aback before exploding with fury and boxing first Kirito's ears, then Yujio's for good measure. Thus, for the last year and three months, the boys had taken turns chopping away at the Giga Cedar with the Dragonbone Axe. But perhaps because they were still inexperienced at the task, it did not seem like they were making much progress on the existing slice within the tree. Three centuries of chopping had gone into that cut, so it made sense that two children who would not produce much in a year's work but it was nonetheless very discouraging to have so little to show for their labor. In fact, if they wanted to, they could be discouraged using much clearer and more concrete evidence. Kirito had the same thought as he glared silently at the Giga Cedar and walked over to it, reaching for the trunk. Don't do it, Kirito. The elder told you not to go around constantly reading the tree's life. Yujio pleaded, but Kirito wore only his usual mischievous grin when he turned around to look at his friend. The last time I looked was two months ago. It's not constantly, just every once in a while. Oh, you and your excuses. Hang on, I want to see too, Yujio added. His panting had finally calmed down. So he flipped up to his feet like Kirito did and trotted over to his partner. I'm going to open it now, muttered Kirito and held out the index and middle fingers of his left hand, the others tucked away into his palm. Using this brush, he drew a shape like a writhing snake in midair, a primitive version of the sigil of dedication to the goddess of creation. Once the sigil was done, Kirito struck the trunk of the, the, the Giga Cedar 
it didn't make the usual dry bark sound, instead rang out soft and pure like silverware. A little square window of light appeared, as if shining right out of the tree's trunk. Everything that existed in the world, whether mobile or stationary, was given life by Stacia, the goddess of creation. Insects and flowers had small amounts of life, cats and horses more, and humans even more than that. The forest trees and mossy rocks had many, many times more life than humans. Every being's life grew from its birth until a certain peak point, and then shrank. When that life ran out at last, the animals and people would perish, the plants would wilt, and the rocks would crumble. A stasia window displayed the remaining life in sacred script. Anyone with enough sacred power could call one up by drawing the sigil and striking the target. Just about anyone could bring up a window for little things like rocks and grasses, but it was a little more difficult for, anim for animals and a background in elementary sacred arts was necessary to open a human's window. Of course, everyone was a bit scared to look upon their own window. Normally, a tree's window would be easier to see than a person's, but the monstrous Giga Cedar was much more difficult, and it was only half a year ago that Yujio and Kirito had become skilled enough to see it. According to a rumor, a master of the sacred arts who was elected senator of the Central Axiom Church in Centoria once succeeded in opening the window of the earth goddess Terraria herself after a ritual lasting seven days and nights. One simple glimpse at the life of the earth was enough to terrify the wits out of the senator, and he fled and disappeared, driven mad by what he saw. Ever since hearing that, Yujio was afraid of looking at not just his own window, but at other large things like the Giga Cedar. However, Kirito was not bothered in the least. In fact, his face was pressed up close to the shining window. Yujio was reminded that sometimes he could just he couldn't just fathom his best friend, but eventually he gave in to curiosity and peered at the window for himself. The purple rectangle contained a string of odd numerals written in a combination of straight and curved lines. Yujio could read just the numbers of the ancient sacred script, but writing it was forbidden. Um, Yujio murmured, sounding out the numbers one by one as he counted them with his fingers. 235... 542, yeah, how, how much was it two months ago? I think it was about 235,590. <sighs> Kirito, Kirito threw up his hands in a dramatic gesture of defeat and fell to his knees. He scrabbled his fingers through his black hair. Just 50? All that work over two months and we took it down only 50? Out of 235,000? We'll never topple this tree for as long as we live at this rate. Of course we won't, Yujio smiled wryly. There was no other answer to give. Six generations of carvers had been working for three centuries and only gotten a quarter of the way through. At that rate, it'll take um, at least 18 generations and nine more centuries to finish. Don't even start, Kirito groaned, looking up balefully at Yujio. Suddenly, he lunged and grabs his friends around the legs. Stunned, Yujio toppled backwards onto the local bed of moss. Why do you always have to be such a goody-goody? Try to figure out some way to deal with this unfair duty instead, demanded Kirito. But he wore a huge smile as he straddled Yujio and ruffled his victim's hair. Ah, stop it! Yujio grabbed Kirito by the wrist and pulled hard. Kirito yanked back on his own to avoid being hurled over, and Yujio took advantage of that momentum to roll upwards and take the overhead position. There, we'll see how you like it, he laughed, tugging at Kirito's hair with his dirty hands. But unlike his own flaxen hair, Kirito's black hair already stuck out any which way it wanted, so the attack did little. He was forced to switch to tickling instead. Ah! Stop! Stop! No fair! Kirito heaved out of breath as he struggled against the tickle attack. Suddenly, a fierce, high-pitched voice broke the grappling stalemate. Hey, you're slacking off again! Yujio and Kirito instantly froze. Uh, oh crap. 
They both hunched their shoulders sheeplessly and turned towards the voice. Standing atop a rock nearby was a figure with hands on hips and chest puffed out. Yujio grimaced and muttered, Hi, Alice. You're early today. I'm not early. I'm exactly on time. The figure snapped in a huff and long hair on either side of her hair, throwing off dazzling blonde light in the meager dapple that reached through the leaves. The girl leaped nimbly off the rock, her bright blue skirt and white apron flapping in the breeze. She held a large woven basket in her right hand. The girl's name was Alice Zuberg. She was the village elder's daughter. She was the same age as Yujio and Kirito. Custom ruled in the entire Northern Territory, in fact, stated that all children in the spring of their 10th year were given a calling and entered into an apprenticeship for that job. Alice was the sole exception as she attended school at the church. She was receiving private instruction from Sister Azalea to capitalize on her gift for the sacred arts, which was the most noteworthy of any child in the village. But Rulid was not a bountiful enough place to allow even an 11-year-old girl to sit around and study all day. Even if she was the elder's daughter and had a prenatural pre gift. Every able-bodied resident needed to work together to combat the mischief of the dark god Vecta. Drought and flood, pestilence, and anything else that threatened the life of crops or livestock. Or there, weren't be an, or there wouldn't be enough to survive the winter. Yujio's father, Oric, raised a barley field on cleared forest land on the south of the village that had been in the family for generations. He made a show of being delighted when his third son, Yujio, was chosen to be the Giga Cedar Carver. But inwardly, he was disappointed. They'd be paid his earnings as a carver from the village treasury, of course, but that didn't make it any easier to replace that extra set of hands to work in the field. The eldest son of each family typically received the same calling as his father, with the daughters and further sons of the farming families usually following suit. The child of the general store took out in the general store, and the sons of the men-at-arms grew up in the guard of the village. And the village elder child became the new elder. Rulid followed these traditions for centuries after its founding. The adults claimed that the this preserved the village and was thanks to the blessings of Stacia, but Yujio couldn't help but feel something unsatisfying with the explanation. He couldn't tell if the adults really wanted to grow the village or if they wanted things to stay exactly the same. If they really wanted more farmland, why didn't they just go to the trouble of moving past the accursed tree to the lands farther to the south? But even the village elder, purportedly the wisest of anyone, saw no need to change any of their ancient traditions. So no matter how much time passed, Rulid was chronically poor, which meant that Alice could study only in the morning, after which she would tend to the livestock and clean the house. Her first task after school was bringing lunch to Yujio and Kirito. Alice leapt off the tall rock, basket slung over her arm. Her deep blue eyes glared at Kirito and Yujio, locked in mortal combat on the ground. Yujio hastily sat up and shook his head before those lips could issue another bolt of lightning. We, we weren't slacking off. We finished our morning work. Promise, he babbled as Kirito mumbled in affirmation from below. Alice graced him with another withering stare, then snorted. If you've got energy to wrestle up after finishing your work, maybe I should ask Garita to put up your numbers of swings. P please, anything but that. I'm kidding. Come on, let's eat. It's a hot day, so we need to hurry before the food spoils. She sat down the basket and pulled out a large white cloth, which she proceeded to whip open and place on the flattest available bit of ground. Kirito immediately leapt onto the blanket, his shoes already off, followed by Yujio. The starving laborers watched as more and more food appeared before them. Today's menu was a shepherd's pie of salted meat and stewed beans, thin sandwiches of black bread, smoked meat, and cheese, several types of dried fruit, and fresh milk that morning. Aside from the milk, there were all long-lasting types of food, but the hot July sun was assertedly doing its best to steal away the meal's life. Alice had held the ravenous boys at bay as though she were ordering dogs to sit, then drew the appropriate sigil in the air to open a window for each item of food, starting with the milk in its biscuit ware pot. 
Yikes, the milk only has 10 minutes and the pie 15. And that was after I ran all the way over here. You better eat all this quickly. Just make sure you chew properly. A single bite of bad food whose life had expired could cause stomach pains and other ailments in all but the extremely hardy. Yujo and Kirito gave a brief thanks for their food before tearing it into their pies. For a while, all three ate in silence. The two hungry boys were one thing, but it was surprisingly just how much food Alice could pack away in that tiny body of hers. First went the three slices of pie, then the nine black bread sandwiches, washed down with a pot of milk. Finally satisfied, the trio sat back for a breather. And how is the flavor? Alice asked with a sidelong glance. Yuzhou answered in a serious tone as he could manage. Today's pie was good. I think you gotten much better at it, Alice. D d do you think so? I felt it was still missing a little something, she said, turning away to hide her embarrassment. Yuzhou shot Kirito a glance and they shared a secret smile. Alice had supposedly been making their lunches for the last two months, but it was very clear which days she'd secretly received help from her mother, Sadina. No skill was attained without long years of practice, but Yujio and Kirito were just old enough to recognize when it was best not to bring that up. So anyways, Kirito started grabbing a yellow marigo from the fruit container. It's a shame we can't take time eating such a delicious lunch. Why does the heat make your food go bad so quickly? Why? Yujio scoffed, shrugging. Because all life drops quicker during the summer, of course. Don't be weird. Meat, fish, vegetables, fruit, it all goes bad if you just leave it around. I know that, but I'm asking why. During the winter, you can leave raw meat outside for several days and it'll still be good as long as it's salted first. Because the winter's cold, Yujio answered. Kito's mouth twisted into a childish pout. His black eyes, rare among the northern territories, sparkled with defiance. That's that's right. The food lasts because it's cold, not because it's winter. So if we can just keep them cold, our lunches should be last longer, even in the summer. That caused Yujio to lose his patience for good. He stretched and kicked Kirito's shin. You make it sound so easy. How do you make it cold when it's the heat that makes it summer? Are you going to use some forbidden weather altering arts to bring snow? The integrity knights will swoop up from the Centoria and take you away the very next day. Hmm... There has to be some way, something simpler than that, Kirito muttered, thinking hard. Alice, who was twirling her long bangs with her fingertips as she listened to the conversation, interjected. That's interesting. W what? Not you too, Alice. I'm not suggesting the using the forbidden arts. Why go to the trouble of freezing the entire village if you j need to make the insides of this picnic basket cold? It made a lot more sense when she put it that way. Yuzhou and Kirito looked at each other and nodded together. Alice, now smug, continued. Some things are cold even in the summer, like deep well water or silver leaves. Maybe putting things like that into the basket will cool it down. Oh, good point, Yujio noted. He crossed his arms to, deliber to deliberate. Right out in front of the church was an incredibly deep well that had been there since Rulid was founded, and its water was cold enough to bite the skin even in the summer. The leaves of the rare silver tree that grew in the northern forest emitted a piercing scent and a chill on the skin when plucked, and they were treasured as a treatment for bruises. Now that he thought about it, putting well water in a pot and wrapping the pie in silver leaves seemed like it would be enough to keep the fresh food in transit. But Kirito shook his head slowly. I don't think that will be enough. The well water goes tepid just a minute after drawn, and the silver leaves don't give you more than a brief tingle. That won't be enough to keep the basket cold from Alice's house all the way to Giga's here. Are you saying there's a different way? Alice snapped, unhappy that her idea had been shot down. Kirito ran his hands back and forth through the raven hair for a while. At last, he said, ice. If we had a lot of ice, that would keep the lunch cold. Oh, come on, Alice groaned. It's summer. Where are you going to find ice? There isn't even in any in the market at Centoria, she lectured like her mother to a stubborn child. But Yujio felt foreboding creeping over him, and he watched Kirito in silence. When his best friend had that look in his eyes and spoke in that tone of voice, it always meant he had some dreadful idea in mind. 
He recalled countless misadventures from the past, the time they went to get Emperor Bee Honey in the mountains to the east, and the time they broke the hundred years expired jar of milk they found in the church basement. Well, who cares? All that matters is to eat the food quickly. If we don't get started on the afternoon work soon, we'll be late returning home. Yuzio urged, trying to divert the topic away as he returned his empty plate to the basket. But the glint in Kirito's eyes told him that his fears were about to become reality, whether he liked it or not. <sighs> All right, what is it? What have you thought of this time? Yuzio asked, resigned. Kirito grinned and said, Hey, remember that story Grandpa told us ages ago, Yuzio? Hmm? What story? Alice asked. She was curious too. Yuzio's grandfather, who had returned to Stacia's embrace two years ago, had been an old man with countless old tales stored in his beard that like, he liked to share with the three children as they gathered around the rocking chair. He had hundreds of stories, mysterious ones, exciting ones, scary ones, so there was no way for Yuzio to guess which one Kirito was thinking about. His friend cleared his throat and held up a finger. <clears throat> There's only one story about ice in the summer. Berkuli and the Northern White. Oh, please, you've got to be kidding. Yuzio interjected, shaking his head in his hands. Of all the founders of Rulid, Berkuli was the most skilled with the sword, and he served as the first chief guard of the village. Given that he lived 300 years ago, a number of stories about his exploits had been passed down and inflated in the telling. And the one Kirito mentioned was easily the most fantastical of them all. One midsummer day, Berkuli was Berkuli saw a large transparent stone rising and sinking in the Rule River, which ran to the east of the village. He fished out the object and was mystified to learn that it was a hunk of ice. Berkuli followed the river upstream until he reached the end mountains, the very boundary of the human realm where the river narrowed down until it meant the mouth of a massive cave. Berkuli made his way inside, pushing against the freezing winds that blew out of the cave, and after braving many dangers, he arrived at the great chamber in the very deepest part. In it, he found an enormous white dragon which was said to protect the borders of the human world. When he saw that the beast was sleeping atop an immeasurable mount, mountain of treasure, Berkuli boldly snuck forward and chose a single beautiful sword from the pile. He carefully picked up the sword so as not to wake the dragon and was about to scamper off for safety when... Dun dun dun. The, so the story went. It was called Berkuli and the Northern White Dragon. Even Miss... Mischievous Kirito couldn't intend to break the laws of the village and cross the northern pass to search for a real dragon, Yuzio prayed. So you're going to stake out the rule and wait for ice to flow down it, he hedged. Kirito snorted. <laughs> the summer will be over by the time I see anything like that. I'm not going to copy Berkuli and try to find a dragon. Remember how in the story there were huge icicles right inside the entrance of the cave? Two or three of those should be enough to test out my idea. You can't be serious, Yuzio groaned, then fell silent. He turned and glanced at Alice, pleading her to scold the ne'er to their ne'er do well in his stead. But the look of excitement in her blue eyes turned his con consternation into despair. Much to their outrage, Yuzio and Kito were considered the two biggest troublemakers by the elderly in town receiving scoldings on a daily basis. But few people knew that the driving force behind their many bouts of mischief was the encouragement of Alice herself, the village's perfect little sweetheart. Alice put a finger to her plump lips and pretended to think it over for a few seconds, then blinked and said, That's not a bad idea. And with that, guys, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. As we read the beginning parts of Alicization. We will continue this in another video and continue reading the light novels. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Make sure you hit the like button. Subscribe if you guys are new. And I will see you all in the next one. Stay cool, guys.